right now we have the entrenched energy monopolies and cartels. You know, we have OPEC and we have the seven sister oil companies that control all the oil and energy. But what people have to understand is that the people who run the energy business in this world, which is the biggest business on the planet, turning over four to five trillion dollars a year, it's bigger than guns and drugs, it's bigger than defense, they control the newspapers, they control the governments. But these companies are so big that they regulate the government which regulates them. The history of science is the history of the suppression of great inventions. Uh, a few classic stories, Nikola Tesla. Nikola Tesla is regarded as the founding father of free energy. His astounding developments in the generation of alternating electrical current are still being used today. His most notorious project involved the transmission of wireless electricity into the atmosphere, which allowed for unlimited power to be freely accessed by everyone. When his financial backer, J.P. Morgan, realized that this power system could not be metered, all funding was immediately withdrawn. Tesla's electrical broadcast towers were dismantled, and through Morgan's many close connections with the media and government, Tesla's career was destroyed. And that situation still exists in the United States today, where a person that really understands what's going on just can't get their idea out because the alternative science and medical fields have been co-opted by the intelligence services. Even Dr. Townsend T. Brown, the uh, electrocrobitic uh, research scientist, uh, has on his 16 millimeter film of his lab test, which we've got here, he has guys with the black suits and black hats come into the place. You can see where the legends come from. I mean, uh, these guys come in and they, they, they look like, you know, bad bark to black man. I mean, it's just, it's classic. And these things do happen. And the, why are we still on oil? Uh, I think we're on oil because, and, and coal and nuclear power, because there has been an active longitudinal, long-term suppression of really advanced sciences and technologies. There are 5,135 patents that have been seized under the National Security Act. And, and I think that this has created both a geopolitical emergency and a geophysical emergency. Uh, whether you believe in global warming or not, you cannot have 7 billion people burning oil and gas and coal in depth. Whereas there are advanced technologies dealing with the physics of zero-point energy so that every home and car would have a generator pulling energy out of the fabric of space-time and you would never have to burn another drop of oil. Why are we not there? Why are we so, doing that? Because there has been active uh, suppression of this information. As Mr. Shin re reported, uh, there are people on my team who have been threatened. Uh, there is a man working on one of these devices for my group. We provided some grant funding. And uh, about two, two or three years ago, a former CIA director, who I don't want to talk about, with a group of people went down there and threatened him and his wife if he didn't stop. So this is a man who's attached to it and and does contract work for the CIA. Yeah. The part of the technology that deals with energy generation uh, should come out and, and has also been suppressed for reasons mainly of macroeconomic stability because, as you know, part of the national security discussion has always been these would be highly disruptive technologies, to which I say, well, good, you want to be disrupted now or later when we go through a terminus with the environment melting down around us. We have got to make these hard decisions. And in the French government, we've had discussions about this. They know that some of these objects are of extraterrestrial origin. They know that some of them are man-made. And the Lockheed Stump Works, and some of my uh, witnesses and sources work in the, so the famous Stump Works. Uh, and I, uh, I will tell you that Ben Rich, who headed up the Lockheed Stump Works, said before he died, and we have a, a witness to this comment, that we, quote, already have the technologies to take ET home. In other words, we already have the Stump Works interstellar capable technologies. We're, we're being told now that we have to, in the face of extraordinary physical crises of energy, the lifeblood of civilization, without which everybody becomes poor or dead quickly, we're told we have to drill for something which is ridiculous and, and primitive as oil. When they have when plenty of here. advanced technologies, they've oh, admitted... Oh, there's incredible advanced technology. So the end game, one of the end games, is if you control people's sustenance, if you control the energy in which they live, the resources which they utilize, and the information under which they operate... You control them totally. It's not free. Nothing is free. Uh, but uh, cheap.
and efficient energy exchange is a viable concept. Now I say that everything in this universe is free energy. It's been dreamed of for hundreds of years that somewhere, someplace, as Tesla said, man will hook his machinery to the very wheel work which drives the universe itself. You know, if you invent a better mousetrap, you know, the world may be the path to your door. If you in invent a free energy machine, there'll be a path to be to your door, but you don't want those people there. Conventional science recognizes that all matter, each molecule of everything on Earth and beyond, oscillates at its own distinct frequency. Can the amplified voice of Ella Fitzgerald shatter this glass? The atoms that come together to form a molecule are held together with an energy bond that both emits and absorbs its own specific electromagnetic frequency. No two species of molecules have the same electromagnetic oscillations or energetic signature. By increasing the intensity of the harmonic frequency of the molecular structure of the wine glass, science can cause the glass to shatter. Believe it. This is a commonly accepted law of nature. So why can't other molecules be isolated and destroyed in the same way? Why can't the oscillation frequencies of killer viruses like cancer and AIDS be identified and destroyed? Why hasn't someone performed the research? Well, someone has. Royal Raymond Rife was a brilliant scientist who was born in 1888 and died in 1971. His studies at Johns Hopkins University led to his development of the technologies that are still commonly used today in the fields of optics, electronics, radiochemistry, biochemistry, ballistics, and aviation. He received 14 major awards and honors, including an honorary doctorate from the University of Heidelberg. During the 30 years that Reif spent designing and building medical instruments, he worked for Zeiss Optics, the U.S. government, and several private benefactors. Because Reif was self-educated in so many different fields, he intuitively looked for his answers in areas beyond the rigid scientific structure of his day. He had mastered so many different disciplines that he literally had at his intellectual disposal the skills and knowledge of an entire team of scientists and technicians from a number of different scientific fields. So whenever new technology was needed to perform a new task, Reif simply invented and then built it himself. In 1920, Reif began investigating the possibilities of treating disease with electricity. He discovered that each disease he studied had different electrical characteristics and started subjecting these organisms to different electrical frequencies. His first virus microscope complete, Reif performed tens of thousands of lab tests in an effort to isolate the microorganism that caused tuberculosis. Traditional scientific procedure requires the staining of samples to make them visible under the microscope. Unfortunately, the minuteness of the viruses made them impossible to stain with the existing acid-based stains. Reif conceived a method of staining the samples with light and began building a microscope that would enable the frequency of light to correspond with the electrical frequency of the microorganism under observation. His cancer research began in 1922, but it would take until 1932 after thousands of tests that he was able to isolate the microorganism which he named the BX virus. By 1933, he had perfected that technology and had constructed the incredibly complex universal microscope, which is capable of magnifying objects 60,000 times their normal size. With this incredible microscope, Reif became the first human being to actually see a live virus. Until quite recently, the universal microscope was the only microscope able to view a live virus. Reif painstakingly identified the individual spectroscopic signature of each microbe. Colleagues of Reif reported his incredible patience, sitting at the microscope many times for over 24 hours straight without a break. Once he discovered the oscillation rate of a particular organism, 
Reif concentrated on refining his method of destroying it. He used the same principle to kill the virus as he had used to make the organism visible, light frequency resonance. By increasing the intensity of a frequency that resonated naturally within these microbes, Reif increased their natural oscillations until they distorted and disintegrated from structural stresses without harming the surrounding tissue. Reif called this frequency the mortal oscillatory rate, or MOR. Half a century later, doctors began using a like technology known as lithotripsy, where kidney stones are destroyed with high-energy shock waves. Identify the MOR of cancer cells. Turn up the volume and destroy them without damaging the host organism. It sounds like a scientific miracle, but will it work on the human body? In 1934, a clinical study was set up at the Scripps uh, Annex. Now, this is the Scripps Ranch. It was owned by Ellen Scripp. And uh, there they set up a clinical study under the auspices of Dr. Milbank Johnson. And they had a team of physicians that examined terminal cancer patients. Every one of those patients was declared terminal by their uh, group of scientists that was involved in this study. Dr. Reif would take some of the blood, examine, find the particular frequency for that organism for that patient, tune that instrument to the patient. Within two months, 14 of the 16 patients were declared cured by this team of physicians. It took another six weeks to cure the remaining two, 100% cure rate. University of Oslo, 1935. While continuing to teach and develop his innovative therapeutic techniques, Reich began a series of laboratory experiments to verify the existence of a physical, biological energy expressed in the emotions. Using human subjects, Reich was able to demonstrate a charge at the skin surface directly related to feelings of pleasure or anxiety. The charge would increase when a subject experienced pleasure and decrease during feelings of unpleasure. From this, Reich concluded that pleasure is the movement of biological energy toward the periphery of the organism, while anxiety is the movement of this energy toward the center. He assumed this energy to be electrical, but was it? And did similar energy processes exist in more basic life forms? Reich discovered that under certain conditions, sterilized and unsterilized substances, such as grass, blood, sand, charcoal, and foodstuffs, disintegrate into pulsating vesicles that exhibit a bluish color. He called these vesicles bions. Reich observed internal motility in the bions, an effect of energy. He also found that certain bions revealed a strong radiation phenomenon seen here as a white field around the organism, and that these bions could kill bacteria and cancer cells. This radiation confirmed the existence of an energy that did not obey any known laws of electricity or magnetism. Reich called this energy orgone because its discovery had evolved from his investigation of the orgasm function and because this energy could charge organic matter. When he published his findings, the scientific and psychiatric communities responded with a vicious year-long attack in the Norwegian press. In the wake of this response, and the inevitability of a Second World War, Reich began to look to America as the future home for his work. In August 1939, Reich sailed for America on the last ship to leave Norway before World War II broke out.